When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thank you for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who once lived across the street from a Kenny Rogers Roasters location. Ladies and gentlemen, blinded by the light, he is the captain. Yeah, it's weird. Their napkins were all weird. Remember that? Because they didn't know when to fold them. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. All right, we have some beer for everyone. We are drinking World Court Mocha Blonde Stout by the good people over at Legal Remedy Brewing Company. Everyone likes a blonde. Stout, that is. We have some coffee flavors here and hints of white chocolate, and that's why we gave World Court Mocha Blonde Stout four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And cheers to our good friends right here. First up, we have Abby and Tripp in Oklahoma. And a big shout out to Randall in Lake Forest, Illinois. Next up, we have Alicia in Zaneville, Indiana. And a big we like your jib to Katie in Des Moines, Washington. And here we have Tabitha and Melissa in White House, Tennessee. And last but certainly not least, we have Catherine in Holland, Patton, New York. Thanks to everybody who went to our website, truecrimegarage.com, and helped us out with this week's beer fund. And if you want to give yourself something to look forward to, go to our store page, order a creepy camper shirt or a logo shirt or maybe a band the van shirt it's a great way to support the show during the times of crises and a great way to support yourself and look stylish doing so and that is enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime All right, Captain, last episode, we were starting to get into some of the physical evidence collected against Scott and forming these cases against him regarding these missing persons. One of the items we have yet to hit on is it involves his phone records. So this reveals to law enforcement that Scott, the last person he spoke to on the evening of February 17th, 2003, was missing person Jennifer Markham. Then his phone went offline until February 20th. Scott maintained that he had gone to the mountains for several days and turned his cell phone off. This is the same story that he kind of gave regarding Casey. But detectives noted that Jennifer's phone was also inactive for the same three-day period of time. After that, there were calls made from Jennifer's phone This to Scott and to several other people. 
This is before it went offline permanently. Now, to the investigators, it seemed obvious that Scott was using Jennifer's phone for the purpose of misdirecting law enforcement in an attempt to make it appear as if she was still alive for some period of time after she went missing. But we still have other crimes, other murders to discuss. We have evidence in the Leanne Emery disappearance. Leanne's car was found abandoned with all of her stuff in it in eastern Utah. But Leanne was nowhere to be found. Receipts for credit card charges to her card made in California bore a signature that was not her handwriting. Detectives spoke to the unnamed inmate who knew Scott in prison, the one who gave them the information about how Casey had been killed. This inmate told them that Scott said that he killed Leanne while they were hiking in Bryson Canyon in Eastern Australia. Scott said that he had stripped her nude or had her stripped nude, kneeled down, and he shot her in the head, execution style. Now, Captain, you know how this POS Scott operates. Right. He has an answer for everything. Scott told detectives that he did not kill Leanne. He said that members of a drug gang were the ones that had executed her, and he was only a witness. But he didn't go to law enforcement. He didn't get involved. And even though he's already involved with the FBI, he doesn't tell them, I witnessed a murder. He, he only has to make up this story when confronted with something that he told somebody else. Right. Now, remember the terrible, this, this angers and saddens me like you wouldn't believe. Remember the terrible accident on the ranch? I'm talking about the accident when Scott's 10-year-old son, Justin, when a 200-pound metal grate, quote, fell on him. Right. You can see photos of this little boy in the hospital on Dateline, and it's, it's pretty horrible. So in a stroke of bad luck for Scott... But truly a blessing. After two weeks in a coma, his son woke up and was able to tell what he remembered. He says his father told him to turn around and dig a hole near this grate. And then all of a sudden the grate fell on him. Then he remembered being in the Jeep. Remember Scott is driving the son to the hospital. He remembers being in the Jeep and he says on the way to the hospital, My dad, Scott, he's pushing me by the face, pushing me out of the vehicle by the face. Yeah, I mean, this is just when you said it the first time, oh, here's this horrible accident, and then Scott's going to drive his son to the hospital. And on the way, the kid falls out of the car. You go, something's not right here. Yeah, you can't. It's what a coincidence that you would have two near death accidents back to back. That day, I can understand that sometimes this stuff happens in a state of a panic. Maybe you're rushing, trying to get him to the hospital, but not with this guy. Not with this guy. There are not these types no, of these coincidences. these are two failed attempts of murder. So the Boulder County prosecutors. Boulder bitches. Thank you. Unfortunately, they did not feel that they had enough to actually charge Scott with, with what looks very much like an attempted murder of his son. This is in part because doctors indicated that his head injuries were so severe, they would not consider him to be a reliable witness. That is so bullshit, though. These might not be reliable memories that he has. Of course, we're no idiots, and we can see all this other stuff together that, that that's probably very likely what happened. And I know the prosecutors felt the same way and were very saddened that they could not bring this type of charge against this man. We should also point out, and it's no coincidence, that at the time of this accident, there was a $60,000 life insurance policy on the little boy. Was Scott listed as the sole beneficiary? Yeah, okay, but hear me out. Why don't you just want to roll the dice? I'm listening. Roll the dice, right? We have, we have two... Like I said, two attempts of murdering this 10-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And yes, maybe his memory is not, maybe he's not going to be 
um, maybe he's not going to be received as super credible. But once you stack on the other piece of evidence that we have a motive, the motive being a $60,000 payout for the death of this child, roll the dice. Because what, what do you have to lose? Well, a couple of things. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. You do run the risk of the double jeopardy charge where where maybe at some point you actually do believe that you have the proper evidence to charge and convict him. And if you try him now and you can't successfully convict him, you can't try him again later. What I guarantee you, this is what my gut tells me, and I would bet this man's beef farm on it. Not my own farm because this guy's a liar. But uh, I bet you what happened, Captain, is behind closed doors, they probably did take a chance because, like you said, what do you have to lose? This is what they probably took a chance on. Let's tell Scott that we know exactly what the hell he was doing and see if it scares him enough that he's willing to plea to it or to a lesser charge. Right. Because, you know, you get this man in a room and you go, look, dude, your son told us that you were the one that told him to get in that hole and then the grate falls on him. Your son told us you were driving him to the hospital and he remembers you pushing him by the face out of the moving vehicle. And this almost kills him. And we also found a paper trail that you stood to gain $60,000 should that little boy die. You're hoping you can scare him into a plea bargain at that chance. And I bet you they took that chance. Right. And Scott is just, it wasn't going to, to fall for it. Now, putting all of that together makes it also seem even much more ridiculous that Uncle Terry magically disappeared, that he struck it big hitting the lottery and then running off to Mexico with some mysterious woman that no one had ever met named Ginger. Right, and no evidence that that he even won the lottery. Or that he's still in existence. Right. So this is one part of the story that we left out last week. This goes down nearly a year after Uncle Terry Kimball disappeared. So Scott's father, his name is Virgil Kimball, received an email at his Idaho home from his brother, Uncle Terry, using the email address Terry Kimball at yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Terry L. Kimball at yahoo.com. According to an affidavit later written by FBI agent Grussing, in the email, Terry claimed to be living in an old part of Mexico with a woman named Ginger and added that Ginger liked living there and said that she was never going to return to the United States so that he probably would not either. This is creating in a sense, an alibi for where this man would be, or, or at least him reaching out saying, this is where I am. Right. Later after Scott was sitting in jail and law enforcement were busy building a case against him, police traced the email account under Terry's name and traced it back to Scott's computer. Ha ha ha. So pays to study computer. Uncle Terry can't be living in Mexico and sending that email. That email came from Scott's computer. And so unless unless Terry's hiding in the basement, then right. then that's coming from you, Scott. Well, and then they found a bank teller who was able to identify Scott as the person who was cashing chair, uh, Terry's checks. Right. After he supposedly went off to to Mexico. So at so, least with this one, it seems like got him. Got him. Throw a party. So other than that, where are we? Now we're in December of 2008. Scott Kimball is sitting in jail on those weapons charges. Investigators had amassed all the evidence we just went through and interviewed Scott about 10 different times. But since Leanne, Uncle Terry, and Jennifer had never been found, and since Casey's cause of death was unknown, the prosecutors the boulder bitches. I do want to point something out before anybody comes down too hard on us for saying, for repeating that anybody that's looked into this case knows that, that by the way, the, the two prosecutors, 
the Boulder Bitches, they seem to have embraced that name that Scott right, created right, right. for them. Because like, yeah, that's right. We are bitches. We're powerful bitches that are going to put you away. Well, and what that shows them is that they embrace the name because they know that him coming up with that name means that they are getting to the Teflon con. They are getting yeah. to the man that couldn't, that nobody could put him away for a long period of time. And even though they're and getting it's a, to well, him. Well, it's also a power move though. We're getting to him, but by saying, Hey, you want to call us bitches? Yeah, we are. We're the bitches that are going to put you away. That's another thing that kind of stokes the fire. Right. And, and you can see, look, we, like we said, we got these missing women to me it it helps that the prosecutors are female because he definitely has a dislike for females yeah well yes i would agree with that 100 percent. but i also would go take it a step further and say that it doesn't appear to me that anybody means anything to this guy at all right i agree attempted murder on his son yeah there is some rumor that he thought about killing his own mother. I mean, nobody means anything to him. Uh, paper, money is worth more to him than a loved one's life. No, but I, I don't even think it's it's money in the sense of like wanting to build some kind of wealth or or anything like that. It's just it's it's him. He is more important than everybody. He's a complete yeah. psychopath. Right. He he's willing to kill his ten year old son to get this money, so then he can continue to just live however he wants. Yeah, almost uh, like he feels like he's a god on some level. So the the problem again that we pointed out is we don't have any bodies for three of these missing persons. So they're they're going to have to shift gears here. And this is a little unfortunate that they're going to have to do this, but they need to try to find these missing people, these missing victims. And nobody at this point believes any of these three to be alive. So unfortunately they're going to have to start talking about a deal, a deal with Scott Kimball. So both the prosecutors, they drew up a memorandum of understanding to lay out the deal that they struck with Scott. He would plead guilty to stealing $55,000 from, from the optometrist. And he would agree to lead investigators to the bodies of Jennifer Markham, Leanne Emery and Terry Kimball. And for this, he would face only a single count of second degree murder, thus avoiding being prosecuted for first degree murder, which could result in a life sentence in prison, or even the death penalty. Uh, we should point out it was still in effect in Colorado at that time. Right. So basically he's going to be charged second degree murder, which would be life in prison with the possibility of parole. Um, I don't believe so. I actually believe that it would have been lesser than that. Really? And one of our prosecutors, Catherine B uh, Booth, she says that it was like, making a deal with the devil. They, they, nobody felt good about making this deal with him, but where their hearts were, were with the victims families. And that meant finding and locating those victims. So this, with what he's going to plead guilty to one thing that Scott would not be aware of that, that Katharina Booth and uh, her partner were very excited about this did allow the prosecutors to classify Scott Lee Kimball as a habitual offender. Now, this status, this is a status that carries a mandatory sentence of 48 years in prison. They're going to get a very lengthy prison sentence for this guy. Scott signed the plea deal in December of 2008 and pled guilty to one count of theft as a habitual offender. Then they all sat down. Scott included to try to figure out how to find the bodies of the missing. Scott drew a map to where he said he left Terry's body. This was near Vale pass in an area that was completely covered with snow in January. So when the map was made up, they would have to wait until the snow 
was gone to go out and look for the remains. Scott said that Terry was in the woods wearing clothing, sneakers, and glasses and bound inside a tarp with nylon rope. Now, the following month, Scott was issued a special release from prison so he could lead investigators to the places where uh, Jennifer and Leanne were buried. Right. This, he says, was in eastern Utah. This features thousands of square miles of desert canyons and riverbeds. So this is not an easy area to to search, and it's a vast area at that. To everyone's disappointment, Scott was unable to pinpoint exactly where the bodies were located. This even after consulting maps and satellite imagery. You do have to wonder here, here Captain, was Scott unable to pinpoint where the bodies were or unwilling to pinpoint where the bodies were. Yeah, that's a tough one. Cause I, on one level you think, well, why would he do this anyways? Well, I guess you're sitting in a prison. You got nothing better to do and you get to go out and there. And again, it's all about him. Mm-hmm. And so, oh, now he's important again. And, and, but I think maybe, I actually think that there's a possibility with some of these that he just doesn't know because these are vast areas and some people think he knows exactly these areas and he's just lying to them, which is a possibility because what will they find and what they might find might lead to actual more evidence to, to prove that this guy is full of shit. So on a second expedition, This again included Scott. They set out in March of 2009, this time to Bryson Canyon. And this time bones were found between some boulders that would prove to be Leanne Emery. Police also found a bullet fragment, which proved to match the 40 caliber gun owned by Scott. Scott led searchers on multiple wild goose chases in, in and out of canyons, Creek beds, washes and dry river beds, but nothing was ever found. uh, Nothing found of Jennifer Markham, right? Cadaver dogs and excavations turned up empty. Well, he's some prosecutors. Well, he also said in an interview though, that where Jennifer was murdered, what he claims is that he was only ever there once. Right. Where like maybe some of these other areas that these women were found. He was there more than one time, but he, he's claims with Jennifer Markham's that he was only there ever once. So this is where police and prosecutors are starting to question Scott's cooperativeness. And they, they're like, it seems like he, he's pretty happy to be messing with us. So now they're going to go out and make another attempt to locate Jennifer uh, with Scott insisting that Jennifer was near Leanne's body. But then they get to the location and he changes his mind saying, actually, no, she could be like 60 miles away. So this is where I think they're getting the vibe. Like this dude's messing with us and he's enjoying it. So despite these efforts, right? But th- this is the moment in time that they uncuff him. They punch each other in the face a couple times, <laughs> and then they beat the living shit out of him with with bats and whatever, right? And um, you know, just can pummel him for hours, and then then shoot him, and be like, ah, well, he ran away. Then you come back to the station. Ah, oh, where's Scott at? Ah, he got loose. He punched us in the face and got away. And you move on with your life, you know. Sentence served. Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm I'm glad these are, are good officers. I, I'm with you. I, I read about Scott but Kimball. maybe they'd be better officers. I hear about him, and I study him, and I think to myself, yes, on a, many levels, I would love to Dexter this motherfucker out in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But, 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 sorry, we're... Getting wow, back to I think, the, I think your your mouth has the corona. Back to the story here. So, um, 
Despite all these efforts by law enforcement, Jennifer has never been found. Prosecutors do believe that Scott was simply holding back the information on Jennifer's grave. This, this for several reasons, their suspicions are that either he's holding this back so he could use it at a later time. Right. If he needs to, you know, holding back something of value to them. But remember his cousin wrote a book about Scott and in that book, it's, it's titled SLK. The agent the FBI agent told the author that he believes that Scott held this information back because there's possibly another body is buried with or near Jennifer. So he doesn't want that additional victim to be found. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. You can live out your master chef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. He's back, and I'm the colonel. So, Captain, with Scott refusing to fully cooperate, per- prosecutors decide to yank that plea deal that they-, they had just entered into with him a few months earlier. Mm-hmm. Now, in regards to this, his 48-year sentence would still stick. So they weren't really running any risk here. This is like you pointed out earlier. Why not try this? You have nothing to lose type situation. Right. But now what they can do is they believe they can actually prosecute him for murder. So investigators received the lab results back regarding the blood stains that were found in Scott's home. The results showed that those stains on the carpet of Scott's uh, former home were in fact blood and they were the blood of Terry Kimball. Yeah, his uncle. His body was found in June of 2009 by searchers using the detailed map drawn for them by Scott. So sure enough, just like Scott said, when they found the body, Terry was tied and wrapped in tarp, and he had been shot through the head. And again, the bullet fragment was then later matched to Scott's handgun. Yeah, and the reason for this, again, like you said, Scott doesn't care about anybody, but his uncle, he did come in to a little bit of money, and he used to carry around a briefcase with this money. And it wasn't a lot of money, but it was a lot of money to Terry. So he thought he was a big shot. Well, he was running his mouth about this money and carrying the, the, the money around in his briefcase. And, of course, you spoke to the wrong person. Yeah. You, you mentioned this to Scott that, only cares about himself. Okay, now I got to get rid of you so I can have this money. 
Well, now that Scott's back is against the wall, he decides that he wants to agree to a new plea deal. So Scott (sighs) ends up pleading guilty to two counts of second degree murder in the deaths of Leanne Emery, Jennifer Markham, Casey McLeod, and Terry Kimball. So they got all four murders technically solved by this time. At the sentencing, the families of the victims were able to read victim impact statements. Jennifer Markham's father said, quote, how many other people are missing as a result of his life? It's time for Scott to be a man and give back what he took from us. Scott did not respond to this. He's 43 years old at this time, and he was sentenced to 70 years in prison with parole eligibility after 35 years when he would be doing the math here, 78 years old. It's still ridiculous that he has any hope of getting out. Yeah. He won't get out. He he will fail those pro hearings, possibly. I mean, he fooled, he's fooled a lot of people. And it's hard, too, because, I mean, I know we've said, you know, these FBI agents were, were kind of stupid and, and the other people that he fooled, and he probably could pick out gullible people. But it's hard, even when you see, like I was, we talked before about him making those statements in an interview that he's only been to the place that Jennifer Markham was murdered once, so he doesn't remember. And it's like, maybe he's telling the truth, maybe he's lying. We don't know. At this point, he, he just seems to lie about everything. But he also, when he talks, he doesn't... Bundy had this way during his interviews where it was like this cockiness and this I'm smarter than you thing. And and Scott doesn't come off that way. He comes off very matter of fact. So I, I don't want to say... my My biggest argument with the FBI is that you know that you're getting into bed with a con man and that you need to be all eyes open, ears open, and focused, knowing that this guy is probably going to try to con you as well. The other thing I notice about him when you talk about interviews with Scott Kimball, one thing that he is amazing at, really, is his ability to answer time and time again with an answer that is just loaded with vagueness that doesn't really doesn't really suggest that that he's denying what you're asking him or agreeing with what you're asking him. Right. It just kind of leaves the door half open to every question, every possibility. So Scott later tells the Daily Camera in a uh, written answers to questions as to why he took this plea deal. He says, quote, I'm a gambler. I know a great deal when I see one. I was already doing 48 years for fraud. Why take a chance of receiving four death sentences or life sentences without parole when I could put four potential murder cases to rest? Right. In 2011, in a 47-page letter to his cousin, this is the, the man that wrote the book, Scott, air quotes, confessed to the four murders. He said that he and Casey were alone when she OD'd on the meth, alcohol, and oxy mix that he gave her. Scott says he gave a fatal dose of heroin to Jennifer Markham and says that he shot both Leanne and Terry. Scott's cousin Ed Coet says, Nobody can have confidence that Scott is speaking the complete truth because of his long history of lying. Now... I think Scott is trying to be honest, but he has problems. I think there's still things he's holding back on, and I think he has difficulty sometimes mentally and psychologically differentiating truth from fiction because he has had to live his lies for so long. I think it's part of his pathology. Well, it's possibly part of the reason why he passed a lie detector test. Because if you don't think it's a lie... And how is it going to show deception? That's just one of many things that the great George Costanza has taught all of us. Right. right. So, but I think these crimes, I think he was uh, infatuated with Jennifer Markham. Well, that's perfect that you bring this up now because I, I want to take this now that we know for certain 
that he committed these murders. We know that by his own his own statements and by all the evidence that the investigators were able to put together. You're, you're bringing up the very interesting topic of motive. Right. So if we start with Terry, Scott comes out and whether you want to believe him or not, it seems believable because, again, this guy has done all these fraudulent things for money. It's possible that he would then kill somebody then for money. Mm-hmm. And he says, well, you know, Terry came into some money. I then killed him for that money. And then we look at like the motive of why he would want to kill his son. Well, that $60,000 overhead as far as insurance. And we already know that he has committed insurance fraud. So is it? it's not that far to go, well, it's another insurance fraud. Just add on murder to that. Mm-hmm. Where I think it gets interesting is the three females. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he meets or basically is aware of two of the females through inmates, almost like he's envious of the inmates. That's right. Oh, you have these girls coming to see you. Or writing, he sees pictures of them. Right. Or hears stories from these other guys. Yeah. And he's such a con artist that that's all he needs, that little bit of an in. And he can then be around you. And I don't think necessarily that any of these women wanted him in any sexual manner. I he might not have been he might not have even tried that angle. Right. He might have just like with Jennifer Markham, when he, when you start going, Okay, you need a place to stay, I'll give you a place to stay. You know, I'll be an answer for you. And then at some point my obsession with you or some sexual desire is going to come out because I do believe that um, Scott is a rapist, a murderer. I believe those were the motives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we have Scott's cousin, Ed Coet, who, who would issue a statement on Scott's behalf and please do not hear what I am not saying. This, (laughs) this is Scott's words. All Right. right. Okay. Don't hear what I'm not saying. These are Scott's words. I mean no ill will toward his cousin, Ed. I actually think that Ed writing the book, um, SLK, is an attempt to help with some of these investigations and help uh, put together a record of, of what we believe to be the truth. So I think Ed's trying to help the case. He's issuing this statement on Scott's behalf. These are Scott's words. This is after Scott's sentencing. He basically blames the FBI for his own actions. And look, the the words of whatever, that that statement that, that Scott issues, some could say it's interesting. Some could say, Nick, could you include it? Would you read it? And I'll tell you what, no, I, I'm not going to read any part of that here because This is a man, Scott Kimball, that is so damn cold-blooded. He time and time again planned the murders of those around him. Some of these people he was supposed to be helping. Some that were helping him. And one person that he planned to murder, but thankfully it didn't work, he tried to kill his 10-year-old son. The only person deserving of blame in any of these matters is Scott Lee Kimball, a man so evil and so cowardice that he tried to kill a little boy. Scott Lee Kimball is not anything special. Even as a con man, he's a loser. Everything this coward attempted or tried to get away with, he eventually failed. Yes, it took a long time, but he failed. Last week, we spoke of a letter Scott wrote regarding the man that sexually assaulted Scott when he was young, and that that man, that cruel and cowardice man, his name was Theodore Payton, by the way, Scott says that that man destroyed his childhood and robbed him of his innocence, and I believe that to be an extremely accurate statement. But Scott grew up to be and decided to be a man even more cruel and cowardice than the man who stole his innocence. So when we talk about motive with this creep, 
it's just not so simple as to pointing to money as the motivating factor. Because when we talk about Scott Kimball, we are discussing a psychopathic killer. One that reminds me very much of Leonard Lake and H.H. Holmes, or what I believe is more fun to say, calling him by his real name, Herman Webster Mudgett. Likely, we have a multitude of motives that likely varies based on the victim. Right. Financial gain, covering up other crimes, and sexual sadism. And Scott claims that his major motivator was greed. Scott wrote, these are his words, quote, If anybody wants to know why I did what I did, my answer is that I always did it for the money. Huge amounts of money, end quote. But Scott is a liar. He spent his whole adult life lying to everyone right. all of the time. So it's easy to believe that he is lying here as well. Because what huge amount of money did he get when he abducted and murdered his soon-to-be wife's daughter, Casey? The answer is none. And then we have one of our beloved prosecutors, Amy Akobu the assistant DA who helped nail Scott said his motives were pretty simple. He liked to control people. She said, I think he thrived more on the ability to manipulate and control the relationship. Even while they were still alive for a while to have that power and use them for what he could use them for while he could until he just didn't need it anymore. All right, everybody, stay safe. Thanks for joining us in the garage. Nick, do we have a recommended reading this week? Today we are recommending The Supreme Gentleman Killer, the true story of an incel mass murderer by longtime friend of the show and author of many great true crime books, Brian Whitney. This is a fascinating book about Elliot Roger. Learn about his twisted world and his revenge plan that resulted in the mass murder of several innocent young adults. The Supreme Gentleman Killer is available on Kindle and paperback. And if you don't have time to write that title down right now, simply go to truecrimegarage.com and click on our recommended page. All right. Until next week. Everybody be good, be kind, and don't litter. Angie's List You Know and Trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.